Hello, everybody, and welcome to the roundtable discussion titled Maintaining Learning Outcomes with the Right Content Strategy, New Pathways for Higher Education in India. So as we can see, we've been very fortunate to assemble an excellent roster of participants. Um, I'm fully expecting a very interesting discussion here today. Um, so if it's OK with everybody, I'd like to start by allowing all of the people who will be participating in the roundtable to introduce themselves. So if you could all just take it in turns to do that, please, that'd be great. Just let us know your name, job title, and institution, please. And please go go ahead whenever you, whenever whenever you want to. I'm happy to get us started. Uh, uh, my name is Raghav Gupta. I'm managing director of Coursera for India and Asia Pacific. I'm based out of uh, Gurgaon, just outside of New Delhi. Thank you. And Hello. Next. Um, uh, I'm okay. Yeah. Uh, you want to start? No, no, you go ahead. We already started. So it's correct. Okay. Uh, I'm Dr. K. S. Das Gupta. I'm the director of an institute called Dhirubhai Ambani Institute of Information Communication Technology, situated in Gandhinagar. It is a state private university and it was established in 2001. And uh, so I'm glad to participate in this program. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Surappa. I'm currently Vice Chancellor at Ramana University. But previously, I have as a privilege to work uh, in uh, the important, uh, what you call the centrally funded institutions in India for the last 50 years. I've been with the Indian Institute of Science for more than 50 years. And uh, as a professor, as a, as a dean, then also I served as a founder director of IIT Ropa in Punjab for six years. Then I was as a secretary for science and technology committee for the Karnataka state. So, you know, I had a, I was a privilege to see the uh, the country's uh, scientific and technological uh, scenario or what you call the map. So, you know, the kind of a thing that exists in a different uh, setups, you know, federal government, state governments. So, uh, it is, um, I've gained, you know, what you call, you know, the insight experience, you know, uh, you are insight experiences, you know, in uh, how the education uh, is being imparted at uh, different levels in a different kinds of institutions. Uh, so maybe that is the one thing that I think I'm uh, glad that I'm uh, able to be invited by the Times Higher Education. A uh, long time ago, in fact, I used to have a very long. Uh, okay, my time is lost now, finished. But I can, uh, Thank you. I don't want to take other time messages. Greetings to everyone. I'm Professor Sandeep Sancheti, Vice Chancellor of SRM Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, I'm formerly, uh, uh, as a, was formerly associated with NIT system, the National Institutes of Technology, and was also the president of Association of Indian Universities. Thank you to THE and to Coursera for this invitation. Thank you. Hello, I'm P.K. Khosla, Vice Chancellor, Shulni University of Biotechnology and Management Sciences. More than that, I, I, I'm also the sponsor of this university. After having retired as a Vice Chancellor from a government university, I thought of entering into private university. And today, it is 11 years old, established in 2009. We started with the college, now we have the university. So thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this meeting. Excellent. Thank you. I think that's everybody for now. We wait that we do have a couple more participants who are supposed to be joining. Let's see if they maybe um, join on partway through, but we won't hang around. Um, so we, the way that the discussion is going to work, we've, we've got five kind of key talking points. Um, and then I've come up with a few questions for each, for each one of those. We might not get through them all. It's probably quite unlikely because I'm sure you will, will all have lots to say. Um, but so just to get started straight away, I guess the first uh, the, the first one is how digital transformation can help modernize curricular design and teaching. So I want I thought that we could start just by discussing the digital transformation and the ways in which it can help to modernize curricular design and teaching. Um, I was hoping that we might get be able to get a few of you to give some examples of how this can happen and indeed how it has happened. So who would like to begin? I can begin. Okay, thank you. Thank so, you. So, did not point out, so I take the chance because on the 
on the photographs that you have shown I'm, I'm this side very beginning so i would like to take that opportunity privilege of starting the thing like i said see this uh, uh, the digital transformation of uh, higher education digital transformation of the universities now i think it has uh, taken a big uh, lead you know everybody is talking about it various organizations lots of meetings are being held now the earlier for last several years uh, some level of digital technologies were utilized to impart higher education deliver to, to, to in terms of the delivery to the students through a very limited way okay now the covid 19 you know we brought in a very inevitable situation where uh, we have to do online teaching so for which uh, the digital technologies okay has to be employed uh, in a full extent so that uh, the entire thing that was done in the in the classroom teaching need to be replaced by this uh, online teaching through the variety of digital technologies combination of the technologies and things like that and, uh, and so, so that it has given now opportunity uh, to use this digital technology to transmit our uh, learning processes of teaching processes to the students and all now the use of the digital technology for the curriculum design i think that is the one thing that is big challenge now because we early day until the covid 19 Uh, the curriculum design was used to be done by the panel you know, by sitting in the paper classrooms or meetings and all now fully knowing well many of these uh, topics many of the top things can be translated can be transformed in a digital way including the of course the either through a video classes or through online teaching okay but now the level of technology required for a complete digital transformation of the learning processes which includes laboratory classes which includes the hands on training skill training which is the ultimate objective of providing the things to the student to make efficient in the terms of the skill sets fundamentals hands on experience so this has been a very big challenge now for all of us some countries have succeeded well because they have got a robot infrastructure because i see that you know you are organizing a meeting from london at uh, this kind of our london or i don't know from where our raju gupta i don't know it is raju gupta it is from the india based i think i i from the initial conversation uh, here i uh, i uh, realized that is coming from london or somewhere from uk and all these things you know this maturity of this technology robust technology even to conduct this kind of a meeting is a significantly there is a lot of variation i have seen in the last two days you know that itself is you know there is a lot of a digital divide in terms of you know using this kind of a technologies even to the conduct a meetings that is happening so now continuously when you have to do this teaching for a large number of students in a country like india where the colleges are located at different locations with a limited wifi okay limited internet facilities you know limited things so it's a very big challenge for us especially in india but nevertheless this is going to be the day it's going to be the future you know where we have need to do this one and how how do you do this work? design and teaching so both i you know there's a lot of uh, new way thinking going on uh, for a class you know when you use you are just using our uh, some of the platforms like you know uh, whatever is the microsoft or uh, two three things that are available and uh, other day this uh, i heard uh, phil bates were talking about this is not the usual of those three things there's something new platform where you can listen on all these things so this is a thing in my opinion i am not an expert in the digital technologies but i have been also observing all these things how it is happening you know how smooth seamlessly without interruptions this can be done so this is one and uh, i am sure the covid 19 may not stay for a long i am sure one day it will vanish or one day it will we learn to live with that one in a regular way and the online class the what you call the classroom teaching also will come into picture but whatever it the, capabilities that you develop during this period in the digital transformations of the education in learning process teaching process in the hands of you know virtual laboratories because if i, I am coming from an engineering institution you know if how to train an engineer in the same way as uh, the one in the classroom teaching particularly when the technologies emerging technologies the challenges societal challenges and relating the science the content what you teach the content to the actual uh, uh, real ground so real real situations and combination of the fundamentals hands on training 
and uh, what you call this uh, uh, skills that they develop and how all these things can be can be put together and train the students in so that the the challenges that affronts us in our society whether it's a clean water or the clean air or you know our housing and uh, many many challenges even cyber security you know the kind of a things that challenges that we are saying and the fake news you know all these things are a big big issue for all of us okay so this needs to be done very carefully and only when you do this one ultimately what we should do our objective is to not only to produce but a highly skilled capable confident man with a critical thinking but it also should be a, a good citizen civic citizen we should play a very important role that is most important that producing hundreds and thousands of graduates i see the kind of a thing that has happened you know one thing it is not the one the desirable you know any developed society should be free from this kind of a you know this very uh, deleterious influences on the minds of these youngsters and so this you need to keep these things that is what is uh, bothering i say when i see that one the kinds of uh, the emails kinds of a uh, social kind of a messages social media being used how people are being abused you know kinds of like hatred developed so these are all the challenges you know how you use the digital technologies you know strictly reasonably strictly what you call for development of a human brain and prepare our uh, youngsters and students you know, to become a critical thinkers and being a useful to the society make a good reasonable impact and that is where the curriculum design how you do that one using a digital technologies and that is where this i think various uh, people are already working like uh, coursera and which are, which are developed the courses not online courses i think they have to take it forward especially in countries like india which is very diversified you have students of different talent different capabilities different level types of institutions which takes all these students and which which we need to provide a reasonable level of uh, you know of, of a level playing field so that the students can compete uh, and you know, after going through this kind of a digital learning process delivered through the digital technologies so this is where i think uh, uh, we need to do and uh, i would like to hear from the other experts who have got more experience than i have got in this area okay so uh, this is what is important so thank Definitely. you very much can i you. speak uh, mr mullen now yes yes sure i was just going just thank uh, i saw i saw the finger go up um yeah, just thank quickly you. So, let's just every, if we can all welcome joseph who's joined who joined on um in the middle of that um Joseph I believe is the pro VC for Assam Bombosco University right great thank okay. you so okay so yeah. let's welcome Joseph quickly and then yeah back to you Dr Sanchefi okay please so, go Joseph. ahead so oh, I go ahead okay yes yes okay so uh, thanks for this opportunity i think uh, mm, we know that digital transformations are affecting or changing our work as well as our life in general education was probably one of the last aspect major aspect which got covered or touched by it therefore it's uh, affecting the curriculum design or teaching learning and maybe any other outcomes and everything uh, i would say that uh, curriculum de design is rather a relatively easier thing or easier aspect comparatively but when it comes to the teaching aspect technology has a much bigger role to play in terms of curriculum design i will possibly say that it makes it easily very very broad based otherwise we knew the limitations that we cannot deliver it something which is not there but now we know that if we don't have that capacity probably coursera will provide or some x agency will provide it to us and they can be very wide and varied i can combine my normal teaching learning activities with the activities of skills or maybe activities of projects maybe activities related to their placements and training everything can be combined on a single platform which never used to be the case so i'll not touch upon the curricula aspect because professor surappa did talk about that some of it i will just give you an a one or two things about the teaching and then give you an example which uh, really uh, excited me that how technology can be beneficial Uh, the first thing about the teaching can be the teaching can be multimodal the classrooms were very dry and very routine kind of things the animations were not there the displays demonstrations were not very good enough we were wasting a lot of time writing down few things here and there and of course uh, it was not very interactive and now with the available of virtual labs you can do the labs inside the class and class inside the lab also any way you want it 
also the technology will give you a very good feedback i didn't have a mechanism that every day after doing my lecture can i get a feedback but today i can have clickers i can have any other thing which can be on whatsapp or some other groups i can get a constant feedback on anything which i want i can also change my speed of delivery based on what is needed and people can play replay and whatever do translations and other things and then once again i can change the level of education delivery in terms of teaching learning depending upon the student's ability which is there i can possibly do more to truer assessments because i am i'm now having the power to check those assessments much more easily uh, the, the the answer scripts much more easily compared to any other mode which was there so all in all you'll find that teaching is also becoming multi dimensional and teachers role is also become facilitator moderator this that and to do all such things which you have you will have to have technology at the backdrop or at the background to help you now the example which uh, really uh, touched me in terms of uh, that how digital transformations are helping is from uh, one australian faculty a young faculty who was presenting his case in a microsoft conference last year in us and he did talk about that using the microsoft tools he was uh, delivering his classes to a group of 500 students he showcased so many things about whatever he was saying but on top of that he said that with this group of 500 students he is able to give personal attention to every single 500 of the 500 students who are there in his class we find it difficult with 60 or 100 also that we cannot give them attention don't know their names can't maintain the continuity but he was able to do it why because at the backdrop background ai tools were being used who is a slow learner sandeep is a slow learner he'll be given different assignments so that he comes up and so on and so forth and therefore you can say that personalized education or student centric education uh, and the right kind of blending of education possibly can happen through the digital transformation and it also helps you late in the career guidance also not only that your job finishes with the teaching learning it helps you with the career guidance also it can do there can be tools like what we call gps global positioning system going from x to y place similarly for student counseling there will be tools in future that you are currently sitting at plus 2 level or you are you are done your uh, undergrad and you want to reach some level you want to become mr raghav gupta or professor surappa i think there will be tools of digital transformation which will be able to tell you how to go to that particular in that direction and reach those destinations so digital transformation is now going to stay here and it's going to be a permanent thing and it will be helping the teaching learning a lot thank you excellent i can see okay uh yes dr kosla if you could uh we'll have um get some input from you and then after that we'll hand over to raga okay okay please go ahead yeah my my colleagues have uh, spoken about the problems of the teachers and the teaching and the classrooms i would say it is an advantage for the students it is going to be a knowledge era because the students will always have the choice to use the material either from the course or from the course given by the teacher or from anywhere he can use a micro segment from our oxford any any indian university or from anywhere so his ability improves the secondly that uh, uh, his choice of mode of learning would change some students like reading other like watching listening and making notes it's not that when we were student we were not preparing notes good students then were preparing notes were using so many textbooks but now everything is available and everything is very handy then the role of the software the soft skill is going to be very very important and using the artificial intelligence and uh, uh, i'm sorry to interrupt there's a there's a whirring sound if i don't know if others can hear it but would just request people to i don't know it's not from from my side i don't know we are from where it is coming so the education got, in a way yeah. is becoming subject relevant students career relevant student mental makeup his own taste and relevant to one's ability he can choose anything from anything he like 
So the, we, it is a challenge for the teachers. The curriculum cannot be stagnant now. If the rigidity days are to be changed into flexibility. So every day the curriculum will change. Every, every movement the student will want something. So another important thing for the challenge to the teachers. The teachers have to be, I would say, the best because you are being barged by the parents also. Those who are teaching in average teachers, they will not have any place in the modern and the present day form. Only the best teachers who can best deliver and make their notes comprehensive using Coursera type programs. Well, at Shirley University, we have made it mandatory for our teachers to do at least two to three programs because we have seen that that the, they're, they're quite adept because if we have to match with the international standard in our learning, we need to follow these laid out standards. And uh, I, th I think it is the student-based education now and it will be less teacher-based and challenge to the teacher to change with the changing time. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Kostler. And now, yeah, we'll hand over to Raghav who has a few things to say from uh, Coursera's point of view. Thank you, Dean. Uh, it's fascinating to listen to Dr. Sudhappa, to Dr. Sancheti, and to Professor Khosla. You know, Professor Khosla talked about how flexible curriculum is becoming, uh, rigid curriculum is becoming a flexible curriculum. It's really uh, interesting to hear that. What I thought I would do is over the last uh, seven, eight months of many universities start to use Coursera, and I think many of you spoke, kind of shared your thoughts as well. I'd love to share a little bit of what we are seeing, what we are learning, and hopefully contribute to this uh, discussion. I have a few slides, and let me quickly uh, share my screen and uh, kind of get us started with this. Uh, Dean, could you please confirm if you're able to see this? Yep, I can, certainly. All right. All right. So I'll talk a little bit about how we are thinking about a digital transformation of uh, higher education and what we are seeing around the world. Um, so firstly, very quickly, I think it's important to think about jobs as well, along with, you know, thinking about higher education. And at a headline level, you know, we are seeing COVID has disrupted jobs. It has accelerated need for technology in higher education. And there's lots of data points, which are massive data points that support it. You know, ILO is talking about upwards of 400 million jobs being lost. Uh, UNESCO tells us that in higher education and in schools, many, many billions of students have been affected. On our platform, we've seen massive increase in uh, online education growth. And then we're also seeing that the regulators in India and in other countries like Malaysia, like Philippines, uh, Kazakhstan are encouraging use of online education on campus as well. You know, AICT, UGC, others have been talking about raising the limits of uh, online education. The other thing that we are seeing, and we work with about 2,500 companies, and we're seeing that the professional world is changing quite rapidly. And this has many implications for higher education. And essentially what we are seeing is what was expected to happen in five, seven years has actually happened in five to seven months. And so all of the statistics that we see on the left-hand side of this slide, uh, slide was already there. You know, jobs were expected to change. Now they're expected to change in the next two years or average technical uh, shelf life of a technical skill was always already coming down, but now it's expected to be about two years. And given some of this context, we are finding that in our work with universities around the world, there are probably some of these challenges that COVID has accelerated for universities. Student employability has become more important because skills have changed and because we will have a recession for jobs for the next few years going forward. So how do students get placed? Cost management, you know, there's tuition pressures. There's also the need to manage costs. And I would say online has a big role to play here because of the efficiency with which online can deliver uh, learning. Uh, you know, being able to utilize capacity in a university to serve more students, uh, faculty development in this new world, not just with the skills of the future, but also faculty development to be able to start teaching online has become important. And then I think lastly, for universities to position themselves as a differentiated brand, given that students are worried about what will be career outcomes, has, I think, become even more important. And with some of this context, I'd love to share what's been happening on the Coursera platform. So our platform, which is Coursera for Campus, uh, we made it available for free to colleges, universities since middle of March around the world. And we've seen 3,700 universities take it up. And you know, before COVID hit, there were 30 universities in India. 
excuse me, in India and around the world that were using Coursera for campus. In the last six months, that number has gone up to 3,700 universities in the Americas, in uh, Europe and Africa, in India and other parts of Asia. And massive adoption, you know, 24 lakh students, 2.4 million students around the world who've taken 21 million courses on our platform. And then 70% of this has happened on a mobile device. And I think some of you spoke about how connectivity in smaller cities in semi-urban towns has been difficult. And I'll, I'd love to share a little bit of how we are trying to solve some of these challenges that these students are seeing. I mean, if you think about 21 million courses taken on our platform in the last seven, eight months, these numbers are just mind, mind blowing. So we've been partnering with universities and saying, how do we uh, together work on the digital transformation of uh, higher education? It's a period of crisis, rapid change, but also it's a period of opportunity. I don't think higher education has changed uh, rapidly so far. Dr. Sancheti talked about how higher education has actually been a slower adoption of, adopter of digital technologies. And I, I'm conscious many of you know the Coursera platform, so I won't spend too much time here, but we have a platform with millions of learners on our platform, about 150 top universities and 50 companies who create content on our platform. And then today we work with businesses, governments, and campuses. And as a part of our institutional work, we are learning very quickly how do we deliver high quality job relevant learning to you know thousands of organizations and millions of individuals in the country and around the world so because we are working with all of these companies we've learned what does the working world need you know so if we're working with mindtree in bangalore we know how the tech industry is changing and if you're working with access bank in mumbai then we know how you know the uh, banking industry is changing as well and we took a lot of these insights and we put this out into a report that we call the... Bye. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so we put this out in a report called the Global Skills Index. And I've been recommending this report to a lot of higher education leaders that I meet because as higher education thinks about how skills of the future need to be taught in colleges and campuses, this is a useful uh, resource to look at. We find that millions of people, including students who are coming on our platform, you know, they could be learning 11 domains on the Coursera platform that are listed here. But what most of them are interested in, what most of them are actually spending time and money on on the Coursera platform are skills which are related to the fourth industrial revolution, which can help them succeed in their careers. And these skills are in the domains of data science, business and computer science. We are seeing this across 10, 15 industries. We are seeing this across 60 different countries. And I think that's something which is probably relevant to keep in mind. So what we've been doing as a part of Coursera for Campus is saying, how do we bring transformative learning to get students ready for jobs of the future? And this needs to include content from top you know, um, educators, top uh, companies. But I think what's very important is that every university needs to say, how does my faculty also author projects, assessments, and courses. So we are bringing the technology to every university that we can to say, let's enable your faculty to also author content. Uh, I think Dr. Surappa and Dr. Sancheti talked about hands-on learning. And you know, I'm aware of the work that NIT and some of the IITs have done in virtual labs. We've also been working on something called guided projects to enable hands-on learning. And I'll show you what the adoption has been of some of this. I spoke about job relevant skills. And then, of course, this is a platform which is scalable. So, you know, if you're delivering learning to 2.4 million students, then the platform needs to be able to absorb that capacity. And let me show a little bit of some of these without getting into a lot of details. So firstly, we are finding that universities are using Coursera for these three purposes. First is for credit standalone. You know, you're not teaching blockchain to an MBA student. Uh, a university is using uh, the Coursera platform to do that. Second, blended learning, which is well understood as a flipped class or, you know, uh, as a complement to an on-campus uh, course. And then finally, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary learning as well. And Professor Khosla talk, talked about some of this. Now, the approach that we are taking is if an engineering student in this example is learning already on campus, high quality uh, education, can we complement that with the university content on our platform? with the industry content on our platform and also with projects on our platform to set them up for success in their careers. And we looked at engineering and we said, you know, if I look at the industry, uh, industry doesn't want just a mechanical engineer. And I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer myself, but the industry wants a mechanical engineer who possibly specializes in 
additive manufacturing or mechatronics or iot or a computer science engineer who specializes in cyber security or artificial intelligence and so i think this approach of saying how do we work with universities to complement what they're doing on campus and bring content which can help students get ready for these career paths of the future is the approach that we've been taking and i think we are seeing some good success uh i said the students on coursera are learning job relevant skills and these are the top courses that they have taken on coursera this year so uh python from michigan you know 5.75 lakh uh, students have taken this course uh, deep learning as a part of artificial intelligence from coursera's co-founder almost 2 lakh students have taken this course uh communication in english and essential skills for business so these are the kind of volumes of courses that we are seeing and students are definitely very interested in uh job relevant skills on our platform now the other interesting thing is we've been building guided projects this is uh something we launched about 3 months ago and the idea is that almost every job today needs us to learn some kind of software right i am a business manager i use salesforce i use clary i use many many softwares so one example here is if i am somebody who studying computer science and i want to become a professional in the domain of data science i might learn a, a software like tableau now to buy tableau to uh, install it on my machine to get a data set which i can use tableau with all of that is very very difficult for a student so this is a virtual machine where the right hand side is a is a faculty member who's uh, teaching how to use tableau and the left is the student screen where they are following along and actually doing uh, a virtual project on tableau and getting uh, side by side instructions this guided project which was launched 3 months ago has just taken off like crazy among students so if you look at working professionals in businesses people in the government or individuals who come to our coursera platform they were adopted guided projects but campuses or students have taken 1.5 million guided projects in the last 3 months and what are they learning they're doing guided projects in building a website html python project management and so on and so forth now what we don't have today is a physical lab in a virtual environment you know we you can't do a thermo, thermodynamics experiment on coursera you know what dr sancheti built at nit suratkal but at least in terms of learning any software we've seen massive adoption here and then the last thing that we announced and this is my last slide and we announced this last week is if a faculty is teaching live today in a zoom class or a microsoft teams class it's difficult for students with low connectivity to be able to access that live lecture so we've partnered with zoom and we are launching something called live to coursera which will go live in the next few months where when a faculty member is actually teaching online uh, he or she can record this lecture simultaneously and then a student if they don't have data connectivity can actually download this like you would download on netflix and offline they can view the lecture they can view it as video they can also view it as just audio if their data connectivity is poor so we want to be able to help you know all of those students who are finding it difficult to access high quality learning so so i'll i'll stop with that that some of what we've been working on uh, happy to take any questions that might be there but also happy to contribute to the continuing discussion thank you i'll hand over back to you din Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Raghav. That was very interesting to find out what Corsair has been up to. Some absolutely huge numbers there. Um, so I'm sure everybody would have kind of taken notes, especially seeing the kinds of courses that people are taking. I think that's that's really interesting stuff for everybody. Um, so I guess to kind of move back a little bit to our discussion, um, and you know, linked in with what Raghav has been saying, you know, looking at the digital transformation, curricular design, etc. Um, I wanted to kind of we just had a bit of a global outlook from Raghav there but you know we're here to to discuss a little bit more about India and that's where um everybody's expertise particularly lies in in this room so um to move on slightly from what we were talking about earlier i wanted to find out from some of you what you think are the india centric issues um that the country needs to overcome in order to take full advantage of the digital transformation and maybe we could um start with Dr. Dasgupta, perhaps, because we haven't heard from yeah, you yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, in fact, uh, this uh, uh, whatever we are discussing about digital transformation, uh, basically, it is um, uh, out of it is not a choice, but it is is necessity at this point in time, and uh, digital campus is the need of the hour. 
Now, so far as the India is concerned, uh, uh, whether it is a content management, whether it is a learning management or whatever it is called, the connectivity is one of the uh, biggest problem and the connectivity because, you know, the students coming across uh, pan India and they are coming from different parts of the country and the reality is the connection is a problem. So we have to have a mechanism by which uh, uh, the delivery mechanism should be such that uh, the conventional uh, internet the way it is working may not be right for India um, uh, at this point in time. In fact, I am from ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization, that if it can be a mix of uh, satellite communication as well as an uh, internet connection together, it can uh, give a better uh, um, commitment uh, to the students. Uh, because uh, even if, uh, at this point in time, uh, the, uh, if the students who are coming from a deep inside field, um, in the rural area, having access to this um, data and having a sustained bandwidth and uh, internet connection is a big problem. So at this point in time, as uh, uh, Dr. Raghav Gupta was saying that, you know, you have uh, a way to uh, connect the Zoom, even in getting a Zoom connection in some of the places also is a problem because we are running online programs and we are having online examination system. Examination system is also very, very important. We should look into it because if online becomes the new normal, then examination has to be taken in a much serious way. And this examination has to be uh, almost closer to the in-campus, if not 100% equal. So we need some gadgets uh, uh, which could be developed in such a way. It is not only it should be high cost, but it should be uh, moderate costly, but it has the capability. It may not have too much fancy. So uh, we have to uh, think of a digital campus as well as the digital gadget at the remote points uh, where the students get benefited. And, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, this is a new learning system for all of us. So if we only talk about, uh, you know, uh, the content management and learning management system without uh, getting into account the last mile delivery, and then there could be a flop in the system, especially in India. So we need to address that uh, uh, very seriously in addition to this. This is my observation on my comments on this. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and also, the, <clears throat> not aimed at Dr. Das Gupta there, that was nice and short and sweet, but now that we're back in the discussion, if everybody could try and aim to keep their responses to about two to three minutes, just so that we can get the widest possible um, group of people in. Um, I wonder, Joseph, are you there? Maybe we could come to you, seeing as we haven't heard from you, but I'm not sure if you still have. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, so do you have any, I mean, do you have any thoughts on what are the, you know, going back again, keeping it India-centric, issues that the country has um, that it needs to overcome in order to really take full advantage of the digital transformation? Yes, ever I'm, since I'm the COVID-19, Somebody. can you hear me? Yes. Uh, ever since the lockdown happened after COVID-19, we have been conducting classes online. We conducted the examinations online. We had our convocation online. And now we have started the new academic year online. The issues about connectivity and bandwidth is real. So we found that we cannot have five hours of class in a day online and expect the students to be in the synchronous mode, listening to the teachers and answering questions and so on. So we realize that bandwidth will become an issue even if there is connectivity. So we make our teachers upload videos so that they can be downloaded in the asynchronous mode. They go through that and then have a shorter time for discussion to clarify doubts and make sure that the student understands the concepts that are presented in the videos. And then there are test assignments. That is the way we are dealing with the situation now to meet the challenges thrown at us by COVID-19. Thank you. Yeah. And Dr. Sanchethi, I saw that you wanted to yeah. speak. 
Thank you. There are plenty of challenges in every country and more specifically in India because of our size, volume. Uh, every scheme which we make uh, gets into a non-linear mode of its operation and that's what uh, we uh, find that it fails us or makes us into a difficult situation. But I will not list all of them. I'll take only two examples of the challenges which we are facing, I would say. Uh, number one would be the shortage of teachers. It's cutting across all the institutions in the country, top to bottom, best to worst, category one and IOE to non those categories in India. Typically, we say that vacancies may be 25, 30, 35%. I think technology can fill that void, that gap. I think that's the potential this digital transformation has. Number two, in this case itself of teaching or teacher shortage, in India, most of the courses, uh, we would say that the, the teachers uh, are not around the courses. The courses are around the teachers. This kind of a concept, if we understand that the courses are fixed uh, first, and then we look for teachers and force them to teach those courses and they find it hard. Whereas we have to possibly look at the advantage of teachers delivering their specializations very nicely. And therefore, this teaching learning itself is hugely hampered by the difficulty of teachers. So that's one example I wanted to give. The second thing I'd like to give once again is the unitary nature of our education broadly. Uh, most of our best institutions, the top 10, top 20, most of them you'll find fall in that category of unitary that they are either engineering or medical or management or whatever. We lack multidisciplinarity. And as a result, a lot of things do not happen very easily because the research, as you know, is highly multidisciplinary. And therefore, you'll find out that in terms of outcomes, products, processes, we are not able to deliver, whereas we possibly have the limited expertise of that domain in that specific area. So both these will be, uh, I would say, facilitated by the technology and by the digital transformations, the shortage of teachers and this. And the last point possibly can be, we are now going to get into a mode where students will be the king or will choose their directions, which they were not able to till now. Uh, means what they want to study, what they want to read, what they want to uh, do possibly will be in their hands. Right now, we force upon them what we want to do. Tomorrow, they will be doing it. And there is a new scheme called ABC, Academic Bank of Credit. And that particular scheme will be hugely be benefited by the availability of digital technologies because without which it was not scalable, probably it was not affordable also, and it was not viable to distribute and cover those vast areas. Therefore, these are the challenges and possibly some of the solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to move on, oh, sorry, Raghav, did you want to, if we could, yeah, we'll come to you and then we'll move on to the next section of the discussion. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dean. I wanted to just add a quick comment on the connectivity point that we've been talking about. And I just wanted to go a little bit deeper in that. Uh, from what I've seen with universities in the country, uh, there are three types of online teaching that are currently happening. So the first is a live class, which a faculty member is doing online. And this is the kind of online teaching that requires the maximum bandwidth, right? When you're on a live Zoom class, if you get disconnected, you get disconnected, you miss the class. And the advantage, of course, is the faculty is engaging with their students. The challenge is fatigue, right? For faculty and for students to attend a one hour class has not been easy. But there's a significant amount of connectivity challenge that we see here. I think the second piece, which uh, Professor Joseph spoke about as well, is faculty members recording their classes and putting them online for students to download later and viewing them offline. That requires lesser bandwidth because you can do it at uh, any point in time. But I don't think enough faculty members are able to create engaging content. It's still a one hour lecture, which sometimes can be quite disengaging for the students to be a part of. And then the third type of education that we are seeing, which is the Coursera content kind of education, which possibly is 20, 30 percent of what a university is teaching right now, which is all asynchronous, which is coming from a third party university. It's not the same university's faculty, which is teaching. It is downloadable uh, on, uh, onto a device. And so the bandwidth usage is low. 
the engagement is uh, fairly good because you know uh, these are good quality content but the challenge is that the faculty and the students are not engaging on a one on one basis and the live to coursera example that i was sharing is our attempt to say how can we make university faculty create content and be able to make that accessible to students in a low bandwidth kind of an environment so i think i think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of connectivity for the country but hopefully some of these uh, areas will help us address some of these challenges excellent thanks very much raghav and to move on to the next uh, section of the of the discussion is uh, we wanted to look at uh, the idea of creating employable graduates and i think quite simply a good place to start is just to, for a couple of you guys to to give us some examples of what what are the current assumptions that these skills are which skills are needed and what are the best ways to identify them so we maybe start with dr sarafa yeah you know the skills for a graduate required so that uh, when he graduates he becomes employable there are many kinds of uh, skills that are required uh, for the employer uh, for uh, for to carry on on the uh, the task that is assigned to him does it correctly or not the communication skill basically uh, which includes both oral and uh, writing skills then you know the other thing when he learns in the classrooms all the fundamentals of the engineering mathematics physics chemistry a specific discipline computer science uh, algorithm and all these things you know he, he must be able to translate what he has learned in the classroom for example if a mathematics he has learned differential equations and integration and at the end you know he must be able to use those equations that he has learned to solve some problems of a, at least of a different of even a easy variety by where he can formulate a differential equation to a problem a modeling you know suppose some issues is given how do you model the whole thing so this kind of a training where he learns in his classroom should be able to relate that one to the kind of a at least to begin with some kind of even a simplistic model system learn about the material science and the material materials how we can use choose the material for a different applications you know alternative materials how how can we come out with uh, what uh, new materials can be used than in the existing one so similarly the for the fundamentals of the equations for example the heat flow fluid flow even the fluid flow you know if he, he may be uh, you able to translate that kind of equations uh, uh, on even the chemistry physics of physics of equations chemistical chemistry of reactions what he learns in the classrooms he able to you want to the human body biological fluids flow in by human body consists of lots of elements how they react with one another one whether it's a calcium or it's a potassium or it's a phosphorus or it's sulfur you know and even a blood flow you know that kind of intuition but with class with the one curriculum our faculty members you know having 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 a depository of that kind of a knowledge of the practical issues must be able to pick up something and see in each of these class what we call in examples can be demonstrated to the student to show and and varying these problems to the different uh, changing the things must be able to think creatively what he does it for exist what is the a clear example of, real ground situations can change significantly uh, slightly then his critical thinking his knowledge based things we should be able to utilize this one so that eventually he becomes uh, uh, you know a employable other where he can you know, immediately the very first day you know he'll be able to look into the problems so this is what is required you know i especially these days the fundamental of this all this uh, computer language information technologies algorithms which has to be taught given at the first year second year things every branch of engineering should learn these things okay and this is how i think in my opinion you know especially since the, the border between the scientific disciplines are disappearing so there is a cross close relation between physics chemistry biology similarly civil engineering environmental engineering you know chemical engineering so this is where you know completely you know it's a it's a science and engineering as a unison you know in thing so that is where i think the passion creativity thinking and hands on experience solving the problems in the classroom so this is a very enormous thing who ever succeeds for example kids in you know in mit and all i think uh, the way in which they teach the way in which they do it is like significantly different from our institutions because we load with so many courses in a semester 
six courses you know laboratory classes and assignments you know the the time for a critical thinking is get lost and that's how i think we need to in our curriculum we need to reduce that number of subject make them to more thinking and during that free time they should be able to learn themselves in certain topics because these days we course syria or you know or ago gupta or even a google or so many things are available so you know that is a kind of a thing in my opinion a engineer has to be done to be taught and to made skill skill set what you call the skilled engineer a skilled technician or a skilled scientist so this is what is required okay thank you very much dr chapa dr kosla can we come to you yeah uh, i find that uh, spoken english yes it is a problem because there is a gap between the needs of the industry and also the graduates we produce with the digitalization and the coming of the covid and the more jobs going out and there the students are to be trained in a way for to become the job givers not the job seekers there the more there will be more opportunities for entrepreneurship making them entrepreneur rather than only looking for a job so the, the industry wants still the new there has to be all round changes in the mindset of the industry because the mid level of the business houses they are all closed we don't know what is going to happen whether there will be jobs or not because when I, when i look at my university we had in business management 200 students were uh, given the job only 110 got the job ultimately 90 are still in waiting and the things will become further back to bust every industry wants the students to we know skilled in soft uh, skills and indians are used to that because if you look at the computerization as it started we were never good in hardware we were very good in software and most of the indian students were going to the us as the software engineers so company looks for knowledge company looks for students overall uh, i would say the managerial capabilities at shouldly we have a developed a separate program the sprint what we call it because we prior to this digitalization we have already gone much ahead we have our own software which we call as ardu and now when we are changing to the examination system the students are copying all those issues every day it is coming up uh, there are so many challenges the software development is also very important that is going to be a challenge that that has to be made indian friendly because we know the challenges of our students they are copy, copy somebody is copying from the paper so all those issues are there which are required to be uh, solved out then the students students are to be made in at every university we we encourage the students to go for patents now patent filing is not rough we have for we have the third best in the country for patent filing now we have gone to the second step transnational how to translate it into go to the prototype and then to go for commercialization that if we are able to go to that level obviously we will be helping the nation in job opportunities and the skill development of the system. at graduate level in science why can't our indian student publish papers in general sc uh, scopus like journals why not at the post graduate in which book it is written that only the doctor student will publish paper we have to change with the changing time if we have to compete uh, at the global level because if our students have to go abroad even for higher education in the years to come everybody will is going to look at the quality of the work they have done over the years so these are the few things which i wanted to add my friend has already had it so i would say that our graduates should be good in knowledge they now this is an opportunity now they can do because we 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 can impart them the time of the lecture is shorter and the time saved they can also be used now for our i would say the overall development development uh, where the bigger challenge is the students coming from the villages students coming with the severe urban, urban area and the rural area in speaking they do not know english so we have developed the program which we call as a sprint and there we have been successful and uh, uh, every every each and every one now we find with the coming of the uh, digital uh, it, i i call it as an opportunity adversity turning into opportunity thank you okay excellent so as we're starting to come towards the end of our time um what i was hoping to do um i think everybody's spoken twice now i'm going to ask another question and then um I'm going to try and go around and let everybody have a say but just for maybe 1 minute each so when it's starting to come towards the end of your time I'll just 
subtly hold my pen up and that know and then you know that you know that you've got maybe about 10 seconds left so try to wrap up okay um so the, ne the next thing that we wanted to talk about was multidisciplinary education um and i think just a, a good place to, is just to keep it simple is discuss why multidisciplinary education is becoming increasingly important in india and if who are, and i'll start with ragav okay and we'll go with one minute from now. Thanks. I think uh, Professor Khosla said this at the start, right? I think we've always had a rigid kind of education system in India. You know, uh, when I went to do my uh, college and university here in India and then later overseas as well, the difference was very, very stark. And I think in today's world where we are looking at graduates working in Indian companies, in multinational companies, working with people in different parts of the country as well as outside, I think the need for multidisciplinary learning has been well established. I think the bigger challenge is not the establishment of the need for multidisciplinary learning, but how does one execute on that? How does one, uh, you know, if you don't have faculty in a given discipline, how do you bring in the faculty, whether that is your own faculty or whether that is faculty on a platform like Coursera? So the execution is the big challenge when it comes to multidisciplinary learning. One, and I see the pen. Uh, I see the pen. Yeah, yeah, that was almost exactly one minute. Fantastic stuff, Raga. Um, and we'll move to Dr. Sanchetti. Okay, I think most of the new knowledge is emerging from the cross section of disciplines, and therefore multidisciplinary is important. Um, most of the research is not limited to a domain specific research; it cuts across. So once again, multidisciplinary is important. If I take my own example, I have not done anything on bio, but today biophysics or biochemistry or biomaterials or bio-inspired computing has become very, very important. And so you can see that how the, the different areas are merging and we are not doing enough to teach our engineers about these kind of subjects even now. Uh, last, I'll give you an example of mobile, a domain to which I belong to. I'm an electronics engineer and we always think mobile is an electronic device, but I'm very, very convinced that most of it is only a chip, a single chip inside. The rest of it, either in terms of costing functions, everything is basically dependent upon displays or the battery or the materials and the games, tools, design aspects, everything. And therefore you can understand that such a simple, common, useful device is highly, highly multidisciplinary. And therefore we need to move there. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks. This pen's working pretty well. Um, okay, and now moving on to Dr. Dasgupta. Uh, yes, uh, you know, multidisciplinary is important, but according to me, multidisciplinary as well as interdisciplinary are also equally important. And the most important is uh, the entry level at the multidisciplinary and the exit at a different uh, point. Because, you know, every student may have a different interest of what type of multidisciplinary courses they are interested in. And uh, my belief is if the foundation is strong and then we can have verticals in terms of di different multidisciplinary and then we try to interconnect them, it is possible. Uh, but uh, the form uh, formulating the course and the curricula and trying to make it more interesting and, uh, uh, you know, uh, job uh, oriented, that will be a very challenging effort so far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Perfect. I didn't even need to resort to the pen. Um, <laughs> pr pr Professor Nalanat, are you still there? Do you have some thoughts on this you could share? Uh, yeah, I'm still here. I was just wondering, our webinar is titled Maintaining learning outcomes with the right content strategy. I was just wondering how did we address this issue? Okay, is that a question for that you would like somebody else on the panel to answer? Yes. Okay, what I was going to do, if we could just maybe stick with the multidisciplinary for a couple more people, and then we'll go, if it's okay with everybody, we'll hang on for an extra maybe 10 minutes and do a quick kind of Q&A where you guys can ask each other's questions. Is that okay with everybody? Does everybody have an extra 10 minutes? Yeah? yeah. Okay, fine. Okay, great. Um, so let's move on then to Dr. Sarapa. Um, if we could talk about, yeah, dis multidisciplinary education, why it's becoming important in India. I remember the pens watching, especially you, Dr. Sarapa. You are trying to be, you're going to mute me by a mute way. 
<laughs> this is this is this is the virtual pen being mightier than the sword. Okay. The virtual pen being mightier than the sword. <laughs> no, no, the uh, the concept of a interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary are paving the new pathways for the transformational of the education, transformation of the technologies, transformation in the whole process of our thinking and approaching the problems. So. it is a it is a it is an imperative over a period of time you have learned how the disciplines are how the disciplines are how the disciplines are merging how the new disciplines are being created so in the process of learning at this at the at the level of a degree program you know this uh, whatever the discipline whether a civil engineering person talking about the materials for a building you should know that has some approach that materials come from the material scientist metallurgist and perhaps you know you must uh, how you can bring in new materials and uh, you know new ways of the design thinking you know is is a is a totally a new world you know new way of learning the things and all so this has to be uh, we taught more rigorously over a period of time we cannot make it every day in one year in one semester everything is a transfer no things and all so it has to go by practice by you know by way by thinking continuous thinking continuous innovation at a budget sorry i have taken more than one <laughs> i knew you were going to struggle but no bad 1 minute 22 you didn't go too far over <laughs> and so then, your pain did not work uh and you know I, i'm i'm a i'm i'm a very laid back kind of guy so we we don't I, i'm not too strict <laughs> unlike you guys i'm sure and just to finish um on this topic uh, dr coaster if we could come to you please so on the issue of uh, multidisciplinary the opportunities have come with the national education policy this is the first time the government of india has come up overall they should all the entire education should be multidisciplinary on one hand it is an opportunity on another it's a problem also because multidisciplinary can only become then the the uh, enhancement of the resources is essential because then you have to give lot lot, lot of uh, i would say the elective subjects the optional subjects and so many things have to be offered so that the student can in the real sense can choose the subject of his choice i i know a case of a student who did his btech very recently he is a top singer and he has taken singing as a profession when we say about the multidisciplinary so that the student can do things of their own taste so if that is the concept that that is is required to be developed and for that the resources would be needed if at in at our institution uh, very recently in the academic council meeting yesterday and we decided let us we were not we were only a science university now we have gone going in a big way on the liberal arts we want that liberal arts social sciences and also Uh, the sciences and also the technology they should go go hand in hand why should the student of the liberal arts study the science uh, as a minor or as an elective or why not the science student study as a liberal arts so that 50% student should st- 50% of the course should be in the core rest of the course should be given to the student of his own choice sometimes the minor can become the career of the student this is what i am strongly thinking that uh, this this is a opportunity the education is changing because when i, I was never a good student and uh, because i never wanted to, i have a very bad in practicals the sci- and the practicals are, but when once it came to me that as a policy maker i became a brilliant person so your opportunity students are going to get the opportunity to be more innovative move to be more uh, i should uh, the time will come when the when these opportunities and the problems are solved out multidisciplinary approach will then automatically come up but we have to accept it at at this moment our younger generation or the younger uh, group of the students and teachers are not accepting it from their heart they think only subject is civil engineering okay civil engineering they know that there will not be any jobs in civil engineering because civil engineering also asks for mechanical engineering also electronics also electrical so the type of the silos we have created those are required to be broken and this is what i have to correct <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I, I feel terrible trying to hurry everybody up when they're in the middle of making interesting points. But we've gone over by four minutes now, so maybe we'll just try and keep it to only going over by ten. So what we'll do, we'll have a quick, a very quick Q and A. Maybe we'll try and get three questions 
um, from different people and maybe just if we could get one answer from, from one of you. So whoever feels whoever feels particularly well placed to answer, please just put your hand up um, and we'll try and stick to the one minute um, answer as well. I know that it's not going to be perfect, but maybe we could go back to Joseph because I know that you did pose a question. First of all, could you just repeat that for us, please? I'll repeat the question. What do we want to say when we say maintain learning outcomes with the right content strategy? Can I would like to uh, respond to this because they are running a lot of courses online. What insights can you provide? I'm unsure if the question was for me. Uh, the audio was a little unclear on my side. Dean, if you could hear it, would you mind? Would you be able to repeat it? Yes, um, Joseph. It was a little, little bit unclear to me as well, unfortunately. Could you so just repeat the question and keep it quite simple to the point, and then Raghav can take it, please. Our webinar was on maintaining learning outcomes with the right content strategy. Could you hear me? Yeah. So can we have some thoughts on this, some insights into maintaining learning outcomes with the right content strategy? I can share uh, how we think about this at Coursera, if that is helpful. Um, so I think the statement, and I'll keep this brief, the statement you said is uh, the right content strategy for uh, maintaining learning outcomes. Uh, so we think about learning outcomes uh, as getting our students ready for jobs of the future. That's the learning outcome that we are after getting them ready for life, for careers, and for jobs. And Coursera's uh, uh, content strategy or uh, learning pedagogy is focused on mastery learning. So in our courses, what we do is build assessments, we build uh, learning tools, and we build outcomes so that if you're learning a particular topic, how can we help you deliver learning outcomes that are delivered towards getting students ready for jobs of the future? And I'll keep this brief in the interest of time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Raghav. You're doing my job for me. Um, does, does anybody else have any questions they would like somebody else on the panel to ask, to answer? Raghav, yes? Yeah, so I'd like to ask a question related to regulation to the leaders that we have on the panel. And, uh, you know, the government in India, the regulators, uh, I know private universities feel very comfortable using online content on platforms like Coursera. While I think it's a little unclear for public universities and can Anna University and can, you know, Dr. Surapa uh, talk a little bit about when it comes to using the government's platform, which is Triam and NPTEL versus using an external platform like Coursera, what would be your point of view from a regulation standpoint? What is allowed? What is not allowed? Nothing is allowed. Nothing is regulated here. I don't mm -hmm. think you are regulated. Okay, we are regulated. You have been regulated in a different way, not this okay. way. <laughs> and, I don't know. think anybody is asking us or governing us that what should we do, what shouldn't we do. We have to see the merit. Where there is a talent, we will definitely imply for our graduates. Because we know that uh, we have to compete with international universities and we are not here to compete with the uh, uh, government universities. Because we all have come from the government. We know the functioning. Got it. Got it. And I was wondering Rageji. if you would give me a grey answer, but both of you have given a very black and white answer, which is really... Rageji, I'll please, also please give you one small answer. Please. I've been in government please. for 29 years. We enjoy and we have a highest degree of academic autonomy to say so. The unfortunate part is some of us don't understand it and some of them, some of us are not brave enough to utilize it. Otherwise, there is no bar between Coursera or any X course or any Y program or whatever. It is. I'm so happy to hear that, Dr. Sanjeevati. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> and let's do one more question and then we'll wrap things up. Does anybody have anything they would like to ask? My question to the August uh, people here would be, how do you measure the outcomes or the program learning outcomes or whatever? What are the effective mechanisms to measure them? Okay, quick I'm not talking about like the objectives, the outcomes to be measured. Okay, who would like to take that? We'll do a quick one minute answer and then we'll wrap things up. Anybody? 
you'll have to impose it on someone then oh if not you'll have to answer it yourself <laughs> uh, I'm, not, i'm not sure i know quite as much about indian higher education as you guys let's go very okay the the most uh, democratic way i can think is let's go alphabetical order so that will be dr das gupta please okay uh, professor sanjati i think you know but you know very well the nirf ranking and out uh, the oi outcome and inclusiveness that is the place where it's a measure of uh, uh, what is the salary what is the uh, appointment and that is all, all, all one measure of saying how good or how relevant the outcome of the program is now those are still inputs professor das gupta the salary and the appointment of sandeep sanjeev is still an input you know, because i can end up doing a bad job any nee, but you know the point here is nobody will give you 54 lakhs if for a bad job and uh, so th- that means that the first level whatever you are trying to do your capability potential foundation and uh, knowledge about the subject they check and uh, that is one way there may be other ways so i was just thinking about that and you will have one to one discussion on this yeah time. thank you that will be nice that's exactly almost that's exactly one minute and that's a perfect time and way to end so yes thank you everybody very much for your input the very interesting conversations going on um and i'm sure that there will be opportunities for everybody to link up and chat afterwards um after this is finished if they need to um so yeah just again thank you everybody so much and that brings to an end this round table discussion thank you thank, thank you so much to meet you all i request uh, can you whatever we had a discussion today can you get a somebody um, go hold on uh, i'm i was telling that today's discussion can we can you summarize and send it to us so that you know it will be an information for all of us whatever we deliberated yeah. Sure. Well, I'll discuss with Hannah after the um, after this, but that doesn't seem like it will be a problem. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.